Steve Hankey, professor of applied economics, joins us today to talk about what inflation and hyperinflation really means and his outlook on gold. But first, Professor, let's look at the markets. Investors were panicking earlier this week as things sold off following news that France and Germany are going back into lockdown. We're seeing a resurgence of COVID cases in the United States and around the world. So we're speaking ahead of the elections. What policies should the government take? Doesn't matter if Biden or Trump wins. Should we go back into another lockdown? No. Why, 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 do, why, do, why destroy the economy in, in the middle of trying to contain cases? The, the real thing is to contain deaths. You don't want people dying. So, so the focus should be on con, containment of and, and, and reduction of deaths, not, not cases per se. Looking in the rearview mirror a little bit, uh, we, we've had Dr. Tegnell in Sweden has been the big epidemiologist that is following exactly the right course. Now, he's hemmed in by the Swedish constitution. Uh, it, it was developed in the 17th century, and it predict, protects Swedes' liberty to move. Freedom of movement is guaranteed in the Swedish constitution. And as a result of that, it's illegal to lock down in Sweden. So they've developed their whole approach in Sweden with that constitutional constraint, no lockdowns. And, and they've attempted to keep the economy going, keep the health safe. And, and it looks like it's working like a charm. They've smashed the curve completely. And the economy has not been damaged as much as economies in Europe have been damaged. So that is the what should have been done. Now, everybody else, it, it seems to be completely confused. If you look at some place, for example, like United Kingdom, the Tory party and Boris Johnson, every day they change their mind. They, they just keep changing one thing, then another thing, then another thing. And, and you get a little bit of that going on, all obviously, on the continent, too, with Germany and, and France and, and Spain has had a real bout of things. They can't seem to make up their mind what they're doing. They have no plan. They don't have the five Ps. Five Ps, prior preparation prevents poor performance. The Swedes have been the only one following the five Ps. Uh, critics of Sweden's plan would point to the fact that earlier in the summer, they had a higher number of cases per capita than its neighbors. And critics would attribute this to the lack of lockdowns and the lack of other precautionary measures that they've taken. Would you agree or disagree? Well, the data say what they say, but you have to explain what's going on. The, the, the demographics in Sweden are much different than those neighbors they want to compare it with, like Finland and Norway and Denmark, for example. The, the population in Sweden is much older, and they have a higher uh, proportion of immigrants that have come in. And those are the two population groups that were hit initially in Sweden. Now, now the, the elderly and old people's homes in Sweden, that, that's being managed. Let's move on to uh, the global economy now. You've, you have an inflation dashboard which tracks inflation rates of several countries around the world. And, uh, you know, we talk about the theoretical concept of hyperinflation as a result of monetary stimulus, but you're saying that monetary mismanagement is actually causing hyperinflation today in some places around the world. So what are the countries that are experiencing hyperinflation right now? Okay, first of all, the dashboard that I put up, uh, and, and it's put up, the National Review covers this thing once a month. And, and the dashboard, I measure the inflation. So it's not just me reporting some hokey number that's put out by some official government agency. For example, the inflation rate in, right now in Turkey, the government inflation rate is, is, is relatively low compared to my actual measurement. My actual measurement is like four times higher than the official number which is only a little over 11% in Turkey. So these are my measurements. They're very accurate. So what you have, you said, who's hyperinflating? 
Right now, Venezuela and Lebanon are the only countries in the world that are hyperinflating. This is, this is misreported in the press constantly. All you have to do is Google hyperinflation and you find all kinds of stories. This country, that country, this, that, so forth. They're hyperinflating. No, there have only been 62 hyperinflations in the world that are recorded in the official Hanky Cruz World Hyperinflation Table. Only 62. And now we have two ongoing. Venezuela and Lebanon. Okay. So why do you think there's such a, a inaccurate portrayal of hyperinflation in the press? What are they getting wrong? How would you define hyperinflation that maybe some people are misunderstanding? Well, the, the, the way it's defined professionally is that the inflation rate has to exceed 50% per month, and, and, and it has to occur in the excess of 50% per month 30 days in a row. People in the markets, for example, they have no idea what the definition or what, what the scholarly work is, who's measured it or any of these things. So, so the press, in a, in a way, you can't blame the press. They, they talk to expert A and expert A says, oh, Zimbabwe is hyperinflating. Well, it isn't hyperinflating. It has a hyperinflated two times, by the way. In 2008, in 2008, November, they recorded the second highest hyperinflation in the world history in Zimbabwe. Then a few years later, they hyperinflated one more time. They, they have, they're not hyperinflating right now, but the annual inflation rate is 394% in Zimbabwe, but it's not hyperinflating. So it's, it's just a lot, of, a lot of confusion and misreporting and, and, and playing fast and loose with a term that gets people's attention, hyperinflation. That's that's a lot different than saying inflation. If you said inflation on Kitka, everyone's going to roll their eyes and you know maybe not pay too much attention. You come on with a headline: hyperinflation. Everybody's glued to Kitka. What, what's going on, David? Tell us about it. You know that that it, it's a spectacular thing. You're right. I might actually use that word in the headline. Who knows? But you're absolutely right, Professor. There's a lot of misrepresentation in the press and with monks experts. So let's look at your dashboard now. Venezuela and Lebanon, what's causing hyperinflation in these places? Hyperinflation is always caused by the same thing, David. You, you run a huge fiscal deficit and there's no way to fund it except to go to the central bank, put a gun at the head of the governor of the bank and tell him to turn on the printing presses to finance the deficit that's being generated in the fiscal side of the government. And, and, and once the printing press goes on, uh, the money supply goes up. And once the money supply starts shooting up, people expect that the currency will be worthless. The purchasing power of the currency will go down domestically and internationally. It'll collapse because the current currency will collapse against the dollar or gold or some other stable a unit of account and and that's gets you into hyperinflation because once you get the money that's being printed by the printing press you want to get rid of that stuff it's a hot potato you know the purchasing power is going to dissolve in your hands so you, you get rid of it you you buy gold or real estate or get dollars you, you get something that's going to hold its purchasing power so that's hyper the hyperinflation story Big fiscal deficit, the deficit gets filled by the central bank running the printing press. They print too much money, the money supply goes up. And, and as we all, all know, every place and at all times, all inflation is caused by money supply acceleration. Right. So here's my question, Professor. Can we have, is it possible to have hyperinflation per this definition in the U.S. I've heard arguments from economists saying that due to the excessive amounts of monetary stimulus, unprecedented levels of stimulus, that this could be a possibility. And that fact, this was compared to uh, the Weimar Republic of the 1920s, where they also had similar uh, concepts of quantitative easing. It wasn't called QE back then, it was, but, but basically it was the same thing. So can we see it here in the U.S.? 
Well, not not at the well. Number one, historically, we've never had hyperinflation in the United States, e- even even at the time of the revolution. Uh, I mean, the American Revolution. <laughs> we did we didn't have a, a high, we came pretty close, by the way, with the Continentals. The currency was the Continentals. We came close. We we didn't have it. Now, the the money supply properly measured again, properly measured by Divisia M four put out by the Center for Financial Stability in, in New York, Professor uh, William Barnett, Bill Barnett puts that out, growing 29.5% year over year. That's, that's the highest rate we've ever had in recent history in the United States. But that would never, even if it keeps up, if it keeps up, we're going to have a lot more inflation. But hyperinflation, Fifty percent per month. This is this is only the money supply is going up by twenty nine and a half percent. Divisi M four year over year. That that's not even close to the amount of money explosion you would need to have hyperinflation. So so that's why the people talking about this they they just literally don't know what they're talking about. It's just ridiculous. So you're, so you're saying, hypothetically, let's just assume we were to aim for that level, we would need even more amounts of money supply and, well, money velocity isn't even there right now. Is that, is that what you're saying? Oh, you, you need a huge amount. Instead of, instead of having 29.5% year over year, you would have to have at least that month over month. Okay. You see what I mean? It, yeah. it, it were, it's just orders of magnitude well, different. Forget the, forget the hyper scale. forget hyperinflation. Let's just talk about normal inflation now. Do you okay, think we'll have talk, yeah, yeah, normal inflation? Yeah. Do you think we'll have yeah, normal inflation in the yeah. economy as a result of monetary policy? Okay. Yeah, now, 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 David, you're getting in the zone. You're you're talking real world now. Let's 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 do a little exercise, a little hypothetical exercise. We we now. We now have, let's say, the money supply Divisi M4 growing at about 30% year over year. Now let's let's assume that keeps up, that keep going, 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 it just keeps growing at that rate, around 30% per year. Potentially, how fast could the real part of the economy grow? At a stretch, it could grow may, maybe 4% real rate. So you subtract the four percent from the thirty percent, and and what do you get? You you get a pretty high inflation number of of more or less twenty six percent. This is just back to the envelope hypotheticals. This this is this is the kind of calculation you would make. My my conjecture: we don't know if the Fed is going to continue at this thirty percent year over year rate for much longer. My conjecture is no, they they won't because they 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 can do the back of the envelope thing just like I gave you. So they'll slow it down. It won't it won't be that high. But but since March, since the end of February, the the Fed has jacked things up so much that there there is has been a big bulge in the money supply in the United States. And and that will eventually feed through into higher inflation rates. So the idea we're going to have no inflation, I don't think is correct. We will have more inflation. And in fact, when that inflation rate reaches, let's say, three and a half, four percent, I think the Fed will get pretty nervous. They 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 are not predicting this, but I think they put enough juice in the system already. Then unless they slow things down considerably from where they, they are running now at roughly a 30% rate for broad money, by the way, broad money to busy M4. This is this isn't this isn't Fed money. This is not what I call state money. That's what produced by the Fed. This includes state money produced by the Fed and bank money produced by commercial banks. That's how you measure broad money. And that's what determines the nominal level of GDP economy. And the nominal level of GDP includes both 
the real component of GDP growth and the inflation component. Professor, why didn't we have inflation the double digits uh, in the last decade when we had QE1, 2, and 3, and 4? David, that, that, that is a critical key question, especially for your viewers, because all, all the gold bugs in the world said the Fed was exploding its balance sheet. Uh, the, the narrow measure of money was going up very fast. We were going to have hyperinflation. No, we didn't have hyperinflation because the Fed is a very small part of the broad money picture. And broad money never grew very fast. It never grew more than about 5% per annum after 2008. And the reason it didn't is because bank regulations and, and Basel three capital requirements came in and, and crushed the commercial banks. And, and actually, the commercial banks account for about 90%, or they did in 2008, of the measure of broad money, about 90% of the money supply was getting crushed by all these bank regulations. And as a result, if you add the Fed money and the bank money together, the overall thing was only growing at about 5%. And that's why we never had any inflation. And that's, by the way, that's why nominal GDP took so long to start growing, because the money supply was growing. Okay, let's talk about gold now, since you brought it up. What's your sentiment on gold following everything you said about inflation? sentiment is measured by you do you do uh, what what we call text mining you look in the in, in the press and see what the frequency of gold stories are well the fr frequency as the as the price surged of course the, the, the sentiment went way up because the gold stories were very frequent I mean every time Kitco was on I was talking about gold. Well, that's fallen off. The gold stories are fallen off and are now kind of stable, like the price of gold. But there, there, there are other aspects to the sentiment. Now, what you want to look for is, is the, the word stimulus. So you mine for the word stimulus. And as soon as you see that coming with positive stories that, that we're going to have more stimulus, gold is going to take off. Right now, it's kind of neutral. I think after the election, there'll be a lot of stories about the prospect of an increased stimulus program. And when that hits, you will see sentiment going up, more, more stories about positive about gold, and the gold will take off then. It'll, it'll come out of its holding pattern. So, so Right now, right now, the sentiment measures that Kaufness and I have are essentially kind of in a holding pattern. Gold prices are kind of in a holding pattern. But given the past behavior of gold, we anticipate that the stories about stimulus will come in more heavily after the election when it looks like there'll be a stimulus package put together. And that will probably be a positive for gold. Professor Steve Hankey, thank you so much for coming on Kitco today. I appreciate your thoughts. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, great. Great to be with you. Thank you. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for much more coverage.